Hey everyone, Neil Belchenko here, and many of you last week asked me to unpack the winning rig of the Colorado Trail Race, and so here it is. Last week I ended up finishing the Colorado Trail in four days and three hours, roughly. So in this video we're going to talk about the bike, the components, the bags, what's in each bag, and you even asked me a few questions last week, so I'm going to answer those questions for you as well. Let's do it. So please bear with me because my voice is still not 100% after huffing and puffing for four straight days, but we're getting there. Other than that, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, I've got a little bit of hand numbness, which is pretty typical, but uh, other than that and muscle fatigue, we're good. So just to share a little bit of context here for the Colorado Trail, in 2012, I did the Colorado Trail in 10 days with a friend and it was actually our first bike packing trip. So it was a pretty big undertaking for our first bike packing trip, but in the end, it was an incredible experience. It not only showcased what us as humans can do on a bike, which is pretty awesome, but it also showcased what these bikes can handle through pretty rough terrain. So in 2013, I participated in my first Colorado trail race, and that was the first Colorado trail race from Durango to Denver, similar to this year. I ended up finishing in four days and 21 hours, and it was just such an amazing experience, and I was hooked. So the next year I ended up coming back, and that was 2014, and that race started in Denver and went to Durango, and I ended up winning that race uh, in four days, nine hours, and 55 minutes. And I ended up actually dealing with quite a few injuries, specifically a overuse knee injury that year. So it wasn't a clean run, but it was a really eye-opening experience. So I skipped a year and came back in 2016, and this was the year that I actually set a course record on the route. But it started pretty interesting. I started with a group and 25 miles in or so, I ended up breaking my shifter because I plopped my bike over on a rock and it kind of exploded in front of me. It was a really crazy experience. What I ended up doing was going back down to Denver, going to pedal a Littleton, swapping out a shifter and starting basically 24 hours after the race start. And what that is called is an individual time trial and anybody can individually time trial the route whenever they want. I ended up finishing that ITT in three days, 19 hours and 50 minutes. And that set a new course record on the Colorado Trail. And that course record still holds today. So after taking five years off the route, I was like, all right, I think it's time to get back out on the Colorado Trail. So that's what I did this year and it went really well. It started in Durango this year and went to Denver. And well, it started really, really wet, but we'll get into that in the question and answer. Let's just dive right into the bike. All right, so the bike itself, the frame, this is a Salsa Spearfish. This is a 2020 Salsa Spearfish. This is the medium size. I'm roughly five, nine and a half or so. Um, so I probably could fit a large, but I went with the medium because, well, it just allows me to kind of maneuver the bike a little bit more, but it's also a little bit lighter and it has a narrower wheelbase. The bike has a 68 degree head tube angle, 432 millimeter chain stays, and overall a 1,163 millimeter wheelbase. This bike is great because it is still a cross country bike, but it has a little bit more of those trail characteristics that you're seeking, especially on the rough Colorado trail. The other benefit of this bike obviously is that frame bag space and we'll get into that in a second but it's definitely a large space to fit a custom frame bag so that you can store a lot of cargo in that frame and then as far as this rear shock it's just a float dps uh, performance works really well it's got the the lockout to it it locks out really really well paired with this pivot design from Salsa. Um, I ended up using the Salsa Cycles pivot design in the, the high position. So the bottom bracket's a little bit higher, so I don't have to deal with as much crank arm to rock pedal interference. As far as the wheels are concerned, I went with these Industry 9 Trail 280Cs. So carbon wheels, 28 hole wheels. So they're super light, 28 millimeter internal rim width. So it's a perfect balance between trail and cross country. I went with the 28 hole wheels because, well, I'm 150 pounds, I'm not that heavy. The rig itself isn't that heavy. They've proven to actually be really, really durable throughout the year. And I've been testing them on the Arizona Trail and just day rides. So uh, 
I'm very comfortable with 28 hole wheels. So these wheels are 29 inch wheels. And in my opinion, it's the fastest rolling wheel while still being able to give you plenty of confidence in descending. It's just the best rollover capability. So I wouldn't ever use anything other than a 29 inch wheel on the Colorado Trail. As far as tires are concerned, I went with the 29 by 2.4 Recon up front and the 29 by 2.35 Ardent Race in the rear. These are Maxxis tires. These tires are awesome. This is a really great combination. You've got that Max Terra grip up front, uh, which conforms to the dirt, the rocks a little bit more. And then that Max Speed in the rear, which rolls a little bit better. Uh, both patterns are great for dirt, loose over hard. That Max Terra up front does a little bit of a better job, especially uh, digging into some like wet loamy conditions. And there was a lot of that out there. And then that Ardent Race in the rear does a really good job of rolling, especially on pavement. There are a few wilderness detours that we need to go around. So there is road, it's not all single track. So this tire combination has that tubeless ready EXO 3C compound. So it's durable, yet they're still rather light. So it's a great tire combination. And this is probably my favorite tire combination that I've ever used on the trail. And yes, it's definitely more aggressive than I've ever used, but it's definitely more confidence inspiring. Uh, which I think actually makes me go a little bit faster. 12 speed drivetrain, uh, 30 tooth up front, and then a 51 10 rear cassette. This is a pretty good combination for climbing. I In the past, I've used a 28 tooth up front. Uh, this year I went with a 30 just because I couldn't actually find a 28 tooth without using, say, like a wolf tooth camo system with that chain line and all that. But with that 30, 51, I'm going pretty slow. I'm going like two some odd miles an hour. So at that point, if it's any more difficult, I may as well just get off and walk my bike. XT shifter, SLX rear derailleur. As far as the chain is concerned, I had to lube my chain pretty often, probably once every three hours or so. So that was something that I really had to keep up with. Otherwise it wouldn't shift nearly as well as you would hope. As far as brakes are concerned, I went with XT brakes as well. Uh, but this bike stock came with two piston brakes and I had four piston brakes at home. Basically all I did was swap out to four piston calipers on this bike and four piston calipers are, they're just a little bit more powerful. But what I find with four piston brakes is it's just much easier on the hands. You don't have to grip that lever nearly as hard to get it to work. Uh, and that's something that's appreciated, especially over four days on a rather rough and rocky trail. And hydraulic brakes, I'm actually gonna do a video on the benefits of hydraulic over mechanical, but uh, just the modulation, the the fact that all I have to do is feather the brakes, it, it's just a lot easier on the hands. And that's why I go with hydraulic over mechanical. And yes, there is some risk there, but I've never had a hydraulic brake fail on me. And then as far as the rotors are concerned, I went with 180 millimeter rotor up front, 160 in the rear. And my brake pads, they're actually in decent shape. That front brake pad uh, definitely has plenty of life left to it. The rear ones I'm gonna actually probably replace here in a second. They lasted longer. There's a lot more contact patch on that brake pad to stop. So if it was a single or two piston brake, I definitely probably would have had to replace those pads. But because there is just more surface area to rotor, uh, I feel like that actually helped save that uh, pad life a little bit more. And then up front here, I went with a Fox Step Cast 34. It's a 120 millimeter fork. It's a reliable fork. It's got the Fit4 damper. It's got a really good lockout to it, especially when I'm riding those, those wilderness detours, making sure it's locked out just to hammer, uh, be able to stand up and not lose that energy. And then just rounding out the contact points, um, I went with a race face turbine stem, a Salsa Rustler 35 mil handlebar, so a little bit of a stiffer bar. And I really like this style of bar. It's got a 20 degree rise to it. I believe has a nine degree back sweep. Not a ton, but enough still allows me to kind of be set up in a nice aggressive position for all the chunk on the Colorado Trail. Ergon GA3 grips. One of my favorite types of grips out there has a nice little paddle like this. And this grip worked really well for me. I opted out of using a bar end because this grip doesn't allow you to use a bar end with it. But what I ended up doing was adding a little bit of tape on the bar itself up here. So I just used some NV tape that I had some leftover on and uh, basically was able to kind of hang out on the bar for wilderness detours or just going into towns. And then also just being able to grip here, just another different position. And then in the back here, I went with the adjustable Transex dropper post. And this dropper post came on the bike. 
and yes, it's adjustable. So it is a 130 millimeter dropper post, but you can make it a 100 millimeter dropper post by taking 30 millimeters of dropper travel out of the post. And that's what I ended up doing. And then I ended up adding this wolf tooth valet. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't actually hitting this saddlebag on my rear tire. So just talking about what's on the bars. For navigation, I used an Etrex 32X and I actually did a full review on the Etrex series and that's linked below if you wanna check that out. There's a lot of people that commented in that review saying, are you kidding me? You're using that ancient device? Well, yeah, I'm still using that ancient device, but really it is the best device for bikepacking because you don't have to charge it. And it's just one less thing to deal with. It just takes two AA batteries. I ended up starting with two fresh Ultimate Lithium batteries and I replaced them just once. And I still have probably half the life left in those other Ultimate Lithium batteries in here still. So really it's not too much of a waste and it's just one less thing to actually think about. So Etrex for the win. Then I also have a really nice spur cycle bell on here and uh, it's just, it just allows me to party on the trail. I just like to ring it when I'm alone or if somebody can't hear me on the trail or if a backpacker has earplugs in or something like that, I'll ring that really lightly so that somebody can hear me. And then on the top here, this is a Phoenix BC21R. And if you go to Phoenix's website, they're not available, but they're still on the website. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but it is hands down one of my favorite lights. It's a, got a nice wide beam to it. It has the ability to go over a thousand lumens when you need it, but I usually run it on the 150 lumen setting, which is plenty when I'm climbing really slow single track. And then paired with that, I was using a Phoenix UC35, which is more of a tactical spotlight on the top of my helmet. That worked really nice. And pair those two together use the exact same type of batteries, rechargeable 18650 batteries. So um, it just, it, they're interchangeable. They work really well. And that's why I use them in there. The batteries are super light and the lights are super light. All right, so getting into the bags here. So this is the Revelate Designs Vol, and this is a dropper specific seat pack from Revelate Designs. And this bag has really seen quite a bit over the past few years for me, and it's held up really well. It works specifically with this Wolf Tooth Valet. It actually comes with the Wolf Tooth Valet. So in this bag, it's pretty simple. I've got my Big Agnes Pluton 40 degree sleeping bag. It's kind of like a quilt sleeping bag. It's not like a full on over the head sleeping bag. It's packed inside currently my Mont Bell sleeping bag cover, which is water resistant. It's not quite waterproof, but that works really well. It's super light and they pack in together. Inside that Pluton sleeping bag is an extra pair of bibs and we'll get into uh, my bib situation in the question and answer because it's pretty interesting. And then at the end of the bag here is a down jacket, a really lightweight down jacket from Adidas Terex. I never ended up putting that on except once when it was rather cold, but otherwise I, it's more of an emergency situation. It's a good idea to carry a jacket in general, especially in Colorado where it probably can snow on you in uh in july moving up to the frame bag so this is a little bit more intricate and i'll actually unpack this stuff in front of you here essentially the frame bag has my repair kit my dop kit and my electronics kit plus a handful of repair items such as a tube pump uh, spokes all of that stuff so this is my dop kit this basically has just a first aid kit in it it's got some wipes in it it's got my toothbrush uh, it's got a lighter. It's got just some kind of emergency items, a trowel in here when I, you know, you need to do your business. And then in this little electronics baggie is basically all of the items that I would need for basically all of my lights, all of my electronics and my phone. So I've got some cords to charge not only my phone, but just in case I ran out of light battery, I can charge those batteries. I always carry an extra light. So this is just a black diamond storm uh, headlight and it basically it just has some one wrap on it so that I can easily strap it to my helmet just in case I lose my helmet light or um, one of my lights breaks or I run out of batteries completely. I've got a adapter to just plug into an outlet. And then this one here is just an anchor battery pack. This is a uh, 10,000 milliamp hour battery pack. So it's not super heavy but it's not light either but this is so that I can recharge my phone um, when I'm out there on trail I like to listen to podcasts I'll listen to music and uh, just being able to recharge it at night 
just to ensure that I have that ability to do so in the future is kind of important. And it, it's a good way to just make sure that you can have juice in your phone in case of emergencies or something like that. And then I carried seven, including the batteries that were in the lights to start with, these of these 18650 batteries. And I definitely didn't need to carry that many, but it's always a good idea just in case. And then I ended up carrying four Energizer Ultimate Lithium batteries. And these batteries are just the longest lasting battery out there, AA batteries for my e trex So um, I was left with two extra batteries. So at the bottom of the bag here is my full repair kit. And I'm not gonna take that out in this video because I did a full repair kit video. And that is linked below that it details every single thing that I carry in my repair kit which is extremely robust, it's heavy, but it's worth it because, um, well, you don't want to be stuck out there and you wanna make sure that you finish a ride like this. Uh, and we'll get into more of that in the question and answer because someone asked me about mechanicals. So the rest of the space was filled up by these two 500 milliliter soft flasks and I would start uh, the race with these empty and really the only time I would actually fill these up was one stretch um, in the Cochitope area where it's dry or it's, it has water that is uh, filled with cow crap. And then I also carried a bunch of Tailwind Nutrition in this frame bag. This, These little packets right here, they just go in your fl soft flask or your uh, water bottle. And it comes with 200 calories per pack here. So you're not only hydrating, it's also a good source of electrolytes. It gives you all the fuel you need to replenish. And this stuff has been working really well for me for I don't know probably five years now and some of the some of the tailwind endurance fuel has caffeine the caffeine stuff is great and it's an extra jolt when you need it and then starting the race uh, basically from here on up was completely empty and that was for extra storage for food and for calories so basically from Durango to Silverton um, I didn't carry anything in there but then from Silverton to Buena Vista, that's a really long stretch without any uh, resupply points. And so what I ended up doing was actually spending $70 in Silverton to uh, basically make sure that I had enough food to get to Buena Vista. Um, and that was roughly, I think, 12,000 calories. So uh, a lot of calories, um, a lot of food, it takes up a lot of space, so having that extra space in that frame bag was important. Just quickly talking about this custom frame bag from Rock Guys. The, I got this frame bag, I think, in 2018, and it's worked really, really well. Uh, it's seen quite a bit of use. I, I really like it because I can adjust my, uh, sus my rear suspension. And then talking about this top two bag, this is an Andrew the Maker top two bag. This is my favorite top two bag, mainly because it looks pretty awesome, uh, but it fits a lot as well. It's a direct mount top two bag, so it bolts into the two direct mounts it salsa has. Basically in here, I just carry all of my food, um, at least a lot of food, the food that I want to access rather easily. And then up front, I had the Andrew the Maker Bar Bar bag, and this bag is great. This is the XL version, so it's a little bit wider. And in this bag, basically carries all of the kind of the layers that I would need throughout the day, starting with a rain jacket. And I ended up putting this on and off, taking it on and off hundreds of times throughout the, uh, the race, especially over the first few days because I got a lot of rain. So this is the Black Diamond Storm Light Stretch Rain Shell. This is actually a brand new rain jacket. I wanted something kind of fresh, something with a fresh DWR coat just to make sure that I would stay dry. So I've talked about these rain pants before. This is a Sierra Designs pretty cheap rain pant and I cut them right below the knee so it's almost a three-fourths length rain pant and I do this because I can actually put them on and off over my cycling shoes without actually having to take my cycling shoes off. So these not only keep me relatively dry because rain pants, full rain pants, your feet are going to get wet no matter what. But they also act as a knee warmer uh, or a warmer in general and it keeps you warm. Um, so I actually ended up using this instead of my knee warmers, <clears throat> but I did bring knee warmers. Next time I'm not going to do that. And then these are the 45 North. I believe these are called the knock-in gloves and these are just some soft shell gloves. They just keep me a little bit warmer when, when it's cold out in the morning or if it's raining out, I'll definitely put these on. The gloves aren't water waterproof at all. Uh, so they will absorb, but they will keep you warm. All right, so quickly talking about what's on me. So as far as shoes, I'm, I was using some X-Alp Launch Summits 
And I'm gonna do a full review on those shoes because I love them and they deserve it and they held up great even on probably the roughest of trails because I probably ended up hiking like 50 some odd miles or something like that. And then I was using some Swift Wick compression socks um, and those socks are fantastic. After days on end of hiking your bike, uh, your feet being lower than your heart, um, just swelling happens. And uh, those socks work really well in kind of reducing the swelling, at least at your feet. Uh, because when your feet swell, then there's no real place for that swelling to go uh, in your shoe. And typically what happens is your, your toenails will swell, you'll stub your toe, um, you'll get blisters, all this, and it's really not good. I've lost plenty of toenails because of it. And those Swiftwick socks definitely do a good job of at least alleviating that somewhat. So I was using some Pactimo bibs the first day. I carried these Gore bibs in my sleeping bag like I was mentioning, and these are just the uh, long distance Gore bibs. These hands down have been some of my favorite bibs that I've used uh, recently, and I've used a lot of bibs this year. I'm actually going to do a video on chamois and bibs uh, in the not too distant future but uh, yeah very excited about these gore bibs and then i used just an overshort just some adidas terex shorts and i went with some overshorts this year just to keep me a little bit warmer when it did get cold so i wouldn't actually have to add some knee warmers or throw on those rain pants and then i used a pearl azumi base layer just to put underneath my jersey and then a jersey here and this is a pack timo jersey um, but the cool thing about this jersey paired with my uh, vest is I can access all of the things in my jersey pockets. And this is the main reason why I use a jersey like this because I like to use these pockets because these are super easy to access. So I'll have my knee warmers, which I never ended up using. I'll have a vest and a buff, and then I also have my arm warmer. And then my helmet was a Smith Network helmet, uh, one of my favorite helmets. It's not a full coverage helmet. It's more of like a commuter road helmet. But the big component here for my race was the Ultimate Direction Ultra Vest. And this vest sits higher on the back. This vest is great because it fits two liters of water plus two flasks up front that are 500 milliliters. So the bag can fit three liters. It has all of these nooks and crannies to fit everything else. And I'm gonna show you exactly what I fit on this bag now. So in the back here, it fits a two liter hydration pack, a hydro pack hydration pack. There's a side pocket right here, and I ended up fitting my wallet in this side pocket, but also my spot device. And my spot device was just right on top here, and it read really well. I kind of looked at my, my tracker again. It was pretty accurate. There was a few times where it was off, and that was probably because I was in the woods and it couldn't read it accurately. But uh, in general, I was really happy with uh, where that spot was and how it actually read the, uh, the satellites. It's got a main compartment here, and in this main compartment, I carried a ton of food. Oh, look at this. Nutty bar, never ended up using it. That'll be for dessert tonight. Uh, but I carried a ton of food in here, but I also carried my spare uh, lenses for my sunglasses, so my clear lenses, and then just like a little chamois to clear, clean off those lenses. Talking about sunglasses, so I ended up using some Smith sunglasses that came with a photochromatic lens. So essentially it would adjust with the daylight uh, and the sun. And then at night I would put in the clear lens, which is just a little bit clearer than that clear portion of the photochromatic lens. Uh, and that setup worked extremely well for me. So it's got this other slip pocket right here and I could fit more food in here and that's what I did. And then it's got these bungees in the back, which is super nice. I never ended up using the bungees, but um, if I was to say clean an article of clothing, I could kind of wrap it through these bungees and let the sun hit down on the clothing so it would dry. And then there's another pocket all the way down here. I ended up using some gloves and uh, I don't think they're latex because most of these gloves aren't latex anymore, but uh, these are nice because it keeps you a little bit warmer, especially when it's wet. So when it was uh, raining on me, I would throw these on and then those um, those uh, 45 North gloves, it would just keep that heat in, kind of acting as a vapor barrier. So that's the back of the pack, but up front here is the cool part of the bag. So up front I had just a quick multi-tool, and this is nice because uh, if I needed to do anything on the fly, I can adjust my bike without actually having to go into my repair kit in my frame bag. I also had some Aquamira tabs in here. And then I don't have it here right now, but one of the flasks right here, 
I actually ended up losing one of the flasks out there. I started with two, um, and I, it must have fallen out while I was descending somewhere. But uh, I would have one flask in here, and then by the end of the route, because I lost the other one, I ended up putting some some different items in this pretty convenient area where the other flask would be. So some chain lube in there, which I used every three hours or so. Also in that compartment where that flask would go, I used the water treatment, the Aquamira water treatment, part A, part B. Uh, you would mix it up, uh, wait five minutes, and then throw it in your water, wait another 15 minutes, and then you can drink it. Uh, this is nice because you can end up drinking your water a little bit quicker than, say, those Aquamira tablets, and it still kills Giardia and all that junk that you don't really want to get, especially uh, in Colorado. There's a ton of uh, cattle, livestock, open grazing. It's really nice to have something that you know will kill, or at least 99.9% .9 know you'll kill all of that junk. This little pouch down here, I just carried some First Ascent instant coffee. This coffee is really good. Uh, First Ascent's out of Crested Butte, Colorado. And what I would end up doing was just uh, filling up one of my flasks with water, uh, throwing this in there, and basically kind of just sitting down for like 10 minutes and chugging the coffee. Uh, and it worked really, really well. And then lastly, there's this zipped pocket down here. And this is kind of where I carried all of my pills. Um, I ended up carrying some ibuprofen and used that actually. And then I also had a baggie of other things. So I had some glutamine pills. So I would take that before I'd go to sleep and glutamine helps with recovery, it also helps with gut health. I've got some vitamins in here, I took those too, it couldn't hurt, right? And then some CBD soft gels. And then finally, one of my most used items is just some sunscreen in there. And uh, I ended up getting uh, another bottle of sunscreen. I used a ton of sunscreen out there. So that does it for the bike, the rig, everything in the bags, what I was wearing, what's in this awesome pack. So I'm gonna head back to the shop and now answer some of your questions. So if you like what you see in our videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell so that you are notified when each one of our videos is published. And if you wanna help support us a little bit more, you can do so by signing up for the Bikepacking Collective, which is bikepacking.com's annual membership. There's a link below with all of the details on what's included in the Bikepacking Collective. As always, thank you all so much for the support. So in one of my Instagram stories last week, I asked all of you, what questions you had based on my Colorado Trail experience and experiences as a whole. And if you wanted to follow me on Instagram, it's Neil underscore Belchenko, and the spelling of my name is in the description. So Toby has a great question. He says, no dynamo. How do you manage power for lights for all night riding? So in 2014, I actually used a dynamo hub on the route, and it worked really well when I was descending at high speeds. But when I'm climbing at say two miles an hour, it just does not produce enough light. So I decided I'm never gonna use a dynamo again on the Colorado Trail just because I'm not averaging a high enough speed. So that's why I bring extra batteries, that's why I bring that battery pack, just to ensure that I have that power to get me through the race. Say if I was doing the Tour Divide, obviously that race is much longer and your average speed is definitely higher. So I can get away with using a dynamo hub for that race but for the Colorado Trail Race, I don't. So Miles here at bikepacking.com asks, I wanna know about food slash calories. What did a typical day look like? So calories is obviously extremely dependent on uh, how hard you're riding, the size of the person, altitude. There's a number of different factors. For me personally, I'm looking anywhere from 200 to 300 calories per hour. So that's how I do my math. So when I'm in Silverton getting food, I have to figure out, all right, it's gonna be roughly, what, 35 hours from Silverton to Buena Vista, and then I do the math, and I think I came up with like 12,000 calories, and I had a bunch of food already. So that's my main ingredient for figuring out how many calories I need. Obviously, starting in Durango, you're fresh, so you're not having as much, and then chowing down a bunch of food in Silverton, I don't necessarily need as many calories as 12,000, so I definitely was under that when I left Silverton, but I got to BV with plenty of food and it worked out for me. You just gotta figure out what works out for you. And then there was a bunch of questions from folks about what type of food I'm eating. So basically I'm starting with kind of bars and the typical food that you would find for day rides, uh, bars, uh, gels, goos, stuff like that. But as you kind of go throughout the race, you kind of want more real food. So in Silverton, I got pizza and I really enjoy pizza, so I got pizza. In, um, in Buena Vista, I got a burrito. 
in Leadville, I got breakfast sandwiches and I actually started carrying that stuff. So I brought a breakfast sandwich, ate one, brought one on the trail with me. Uh, so just trying to find real food out there. After a while, my tongue kind of breaks down and it really doesn't like really exotic foods or even really salty foods after a while. So I have to be conscious of that. So a lot of nuts, I'll just start eating nuts and just bars and stuff like that. Really, it's not all that glorious. Um, I really enjoy gummy bears, gummy worms, um, Swedish fish. Uh, so yeah, just whatever kind of looks good when I go in the store, that's kind of what I'll buy. So Rob asks, what's the main difference between your race rig and your bike packing rig? And really, there's not a huge difference. The biggest difference here is a tent. More than likely, I'm always gonna be carrying a tent or some sort of shelter just because it's a little bit more cozy. And if it rains at night, I probably won't get wet versus sleeping in a bivy sack. There's definitely potential for me to get wet. And then I'll also be bringing just an extra pair of clothes. I'll be bringing long johns. I'll probably have maybe a flask. In general, I'll more than likely have a bigger handlebar bag than I did in this setup where I can actually store that stuff. And then I'll also be carrying a stove and obviously freeze dried meals or some sort of meal uh, that uses a stove, some oatmeal, stuff like that. Someone asked if I actively change tire pressures throughout the race. I set my rear tire at 23 PSI and I set my front tire at 20 PSI and I did not touch it throughout the whole race. After every descent, I'll probably feel my tires just to make sure that there's proper air pressure in them. Uh, after that big descent, but I never touched my tire pressure and I didn't have to add any air to my tires uh, for this race. So someone asked, when do you call it during a mechanical? So say I have a mechanical and I just can't make it work. I can't limp home anymore. So there's a few things. Obviously, you know, if your derailleur hangers break and I actually was carrying an extra derailleur hanger and I use wheels manufacturing derailleur hangers just because they are a little bit stronger than the stock derailleur hangers that come uh, on this Salsa Cycle Spearfish. Another thing would be a broken frame, but I would definitely tell you to look at my repair kit resource that I have because it kind of goes into detail on how much I can actually fix on my bike. And really it's quite a bit, everything from sewing a slash sidewall, obviously uh, repairing your chain, uh, repairing all the bolts on my bike, Really, these bikes have come a long way. They are super strong, durable, and they're made for this type of terrain. So I'm really not worried about the bike as much as I am the body and, well, probably the weather and stuff like that. So what's your hygiene protocol for the race, someone asked. That's a really, really good question. So when you're riding for four straight days with very minimal sleep, that means that your body isn't recovering. And because it's not recovering, well, it's just kind of getting beaten down more and more and more. And that is the case for the rear end. And so, yes, I have to take care of myself. And so this year, that's why I used those two bibs and why I use two different types of bibs. Because when I sit down on the saddle, each chamois of the bib is going to kind of react a little bit differently. So when I was using the bibs the first day, those weren't, they just weren't very friendly to my butt. Uh, for some weird reason, I don't know why. So then I used the gore bibs for the rest of the three days and they worked really well. Yes, my butt does scab up, uh, but we do not need to get into that. I brought some antibiotic cream and I put it on that before I went to sleep. Uh, and then I also have some sunscreen that can kind of double as just lotion to kind of help heal it up using your resources and just kind of figuring out how it works. But obviously grocery stores, gas stations all have stuff to help heal uh, sores like that. So someone asked, what piece of gear can you ditch to save weight? And actually this year I added a piece of gear, a pretty big piece of gear, and that is my sleeping bag. My thought process here was I wanted a little bit better sleep. In past years, uh, I found myself shivering at night, even with a down jacket on. So this year I wanted to bring a sleeping bag so that I had a more comfortable night rest so that I could actually recover even though I'm not sleeping that much. So I added my 40 degree Pluton Big Agnes sleeping bag and I was really happy I brought it although the first two nights I really did not sleep that well. Um, and then that last night I got probably an hour and a half of sleep and I just conked out for an hour and a half straight and it felt really, really good. But uh, I would definitely bring that sleeping bag again uh, but one thing I don't bring, I never have, is a sleeping pad. But typically I can find some really nice loamy areas to uh, to sleep on. And typically the ground isn't super, super cold. 
Uh, if it had rained or something like that, it's definitely going to be colder. Uh, so usually the sleeping pad, the insulation isn't nearly as important in the summer in Colorado, but it can be, it definitely can snow. So you just got to pick and choose if you want to bring one or not. And I've just opted out of bringing one for four races now. Somebody asked, how do you deal with the weather you all had? And that's a really good question. Uh, it's a lot of mental strength, a lot of pushing through, understanding it hopefully will end, you know, and uh, and it did. And that's the beauty of uh, monsoonal moisture. Typically it does end. It's not a consistent rain, although it has happened before. But this year I got out of Silverton and it just dumped rain on me. Uh, I got up to 12, 13,000 feet and it started raining on me even more, sideways wind. Um, and I actually turned my bike around at one point and I was like, I need to go back to get to shelter because this is scary. And then I had a talk with myself, turned my bike back around. And I was like, Neil, if you go back, your race is done. And so I just kept pushing on through. So it's a, it's a lot of mental. And these types of rides, these types of races, I always say it's 50% mental, 50% physical. You have to physically be prepared for you know the altitude, the really steep climbs, descents, uh, the rough terrain but you also have to be mentally prepared to kind of fight the weather a little bit. Um, and if there was lightning or something like that, obviously I'd be taking shelter, but I didn't have to deal with lightning this year. Uh, in past years I have, and I've stayed at Treeline, but this year we're, we're pretty lucky. And really the, the first day was the only real bad day. I got wet the second day as well, but uh, in general, um, yeah, just be mentally prepared and uh, that'll help, that'll go a long way. So the last question is, what IPA did I choose at the end? And I actually, I, I finished at seven in the morning and I went home and I slept and I don't even remember the first beer I drank, but I do believe it was an IPA. I don't know if it was a hazy or whatnot, but typically after the end of these races, I'm just really beat up and uh, just exhausted. Um, my wife always takes photos of me sleeping in the car and I'm just, just conked out, just really tired. Um, at night, I'm just like uh, making noises while I'm sleeping. And it's really kind of entertaining. It's like uh, just full on exhaustion. And as the, the week progresses, I get better and better, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it definitely takes a lot out of you. So thank you all so much for the questions. Thank you all so much for watching. I truly, truly, truly appreciate it. And until next time, paddle further.